Rima? Uh, please identify yourself for the audience. Yes, of course. I'm Rima Rudd. I'm a member of the Roundtable. And um, there are two questions that I wanted to bring up. And the first is not directly a health literacy question, but it's an issue in that broader realm. And you said we should devote, um, sorry, uh, we should devote a day to this issue of legal, ethical, and social implications of new technology. I hearken back to a Roundtable forum that took place about five or six years ago. Um, and there was discussion about ownership of data and control over data. And I didn't hear that brought up at all so far today. And the example that was given at the IOM workshop was um, developments that were being made for teens and for homeless population. So that they could, these are traveling population groups, so that they could have the data, but they can make a decision of how much data that's stored in somewhere safe that they have ownership over that they wish to share. So if they're seeing a clinician and they don't choose to share the mental health data that's there for privacy reasons, they have that option to do that. And it seems to me that, there, that those discussions of control and ownership are incredibly important. It's almost as though we've assumed that the healthcare system is due its right to own the data about us. And I think that that notion needs to be brought to the table. Um, and I wonder if it's coming up in any of your work or in any of your discussions. I know in our project where the patients can actually submit comments through a microblog about questions about their plan of care, this question comes up a lot. So what are you doing with that data? You know, does the patient have the right to, you know, when they ask for their full record, can they get their blog to uh, find? And so right now in this research context, we're not providing it. What we're looking at are what are the types of, um, you know, what are, what are the questions that patients have? And then what kinds of recommendations or what kinds of infrastructure do we need to build within the hospital to be able to provide access to these uh, kind of data. But I think the other thing in looking at um, examples of patient-generated health information, a lot of what's written um, has an assumption that any data that patients submit needs to be reviewed before it gets into the health uh, record. And so, you know, at least with our project, um, we have made the um, judgment that that's not the case. You know, patients want to report their goals, those are their goals, and they should just be able to submit them, and then hopefully that will help us understand better and get on the same page with them. So, you know, we are giving them access to their record, anything that they submit, but, you know, we haven't really tackled the question completely. Thank you. So I really like the model that you described in which the patient has their data somewhere and they choose whom to give access to and how to use it. Um, I tend to dislike the term ownership in this particular context. I don't think anyone really owns data in an electronic context in which it can be easily copied and dispersed. So I think more of the emphasis, and I know I'm just delving into terminology here, but I like the control piece, thinking about, you know, given the subject, if you will, the patient, more control over how something is used rather than going down the rabbit hole of discussing who owns something. Because again, in an electronic world, you copy it a gazillion times. It's not like who owns that house. It's different in the physical world. In the electronic world, you can easily copy and share and change things in the blink of an eye at relatively little cost. So a, a small shift in how to talk about it, but again, I, I would sort of stay away from ownership per se. Yeah, I mean, I think the issue of, you know, what, who is allowed to do what, for what purpose, in what context, and when, um, remains an overarching theme in, in, you know, a lot of the work that, that I'm involved in. Um, and, I, you know, it's partly why I showed the slide that differentiates between sort of how health systems treat data and the protections versus sort of everybody else, because at least there, they are stewards of the data. They have a legal record that they're responsible for maintaining. And in fact, they and researchers, you know, when it's, um, you know, when it goes through the IRB process or some has some review component, they're held to a higher standard. 
It's all the other stuff that's happening where I feel like there's even less um, control, <laughs> knowledge, there's, you know, tremendous asymmetry and also less control that people have to exert. Um, and I think, um, you know, it would be great to see more of that, but at a basic level, it would be great to see more of the data even just coming back to the individuals. Um, so that if there is a time when you have all of your information nicely organized by some tool, then you could authorize it to travel to certain places, but we're just not there yet. Thank you. I'll resist the temptation to continue to engage on that topic, but really state that this is something that's worthy of ex expanded conversation. Um, my second question is more health literacy related. So I was intrigued um, by uh, the work that's going on at the Brigham, aside from the fact that it's next door to me. I'm yeah. eager to learn uh, more about that. But there are a number of us who have been arguing for a, over a decade about the fact that health literacy really must be more evenly distributed in our examination of it, and there are two sides to the coin. So one cannot measure someone's listening skills without measuring the speaking skills. One cannot measure literacy skills without understanding the difficulty and complexity of the various texts. So while the excitement, um, and I really love what's happening with this project and do want to learn more about training the team I'm just wondering if in the evaluation there is not just measures of patients' literacy skills, but some measure that's going to differentiate team A from team B because team A has better communication skills. So are there any measures that are, com that are coming out of this that are going to measure the provider skills? There was a wonderful article, and I think one of the authors is behind me, um, uh, that came out recently looking at the 51, 51 measures of patient deficits, essentially, patients' literacy skills. There is zero measure of a provider's communication skills. And so I'm just wondering to push that agenda a little bit further so that we are addressing both sides of the coin. Is there any thought um, to that side? Sure. So with this particular project, what we did is set up what the standard was for communication. Um, and the providers are actually documenting when they address patients' needs, concerns, and expectations. And what we're doing is tracking the frequency with which they document in the different phases of care. So when a patient first comes into the emergency or into the uh, intensive care unit um, as they're being treatment and as they are transitioning out. And what are the conversations that occurred? And and is that reflected in their documentation? Because um, you know this took again a different. It's sort of a paradigm shift because uh, for some clinicians they thought, well, this isn't something we would typically write about. But we think it's really important that there is some documentation that the patient's needs, concerns, and expectations are addressed. And if they are not met, that there's a plan to address them as they transition to the next level. That's how we're doing it. Just start. Thank you. Ruth Parker, thank you guys so much. That, that was wonderful. So I, I wanted to go back to Bernie's first question about um, the EHRs and um, what they're being used for, and just add one comment to that. As someone who's been fortunate enough to be a practitioner in the pre and post EHR eras, um, and, and yes, there's some things that are better, no question, and there are also a lot of frustrations, and that's where we started with Bob Wachter's recent piece, and um, a lot of what we know goes on clinically, like rounds last week when I saw a person with a tube in every orifice, and the EHR says stable, and you want to write, there's nothing stable about having a tube in every orifice of your body, but electronically it happens, and there are quality reports being generated automatically off that. But there's one thing very clear about EHRs, billings are improving. And so that's a really big issue for patients. It's a really big, big issue for all of us, and I want to make sure it gets on the record. So the EHRs that we have and that we use came to be because we addressed that part of it. And I think we're in the, the embryonic phases of figuring out how they can be useful and good. And we remain in that. But I wanted to say one thing about them that is very clear is that the billings 
are more in order than that they, than they were before, and a lot of that has to do with the capabilities and how are they designed and on the user interface on the front end. So it transitions me to my question, which is, <clears throat> Allison, you spoke about Academy Health's consumer patient researcher for roundtable, um, and I'm I'm interested from all of you. What do we really know from patients and consumers about what they really care about regarding this topic, and especially those who may struggle more than others to understand what's really going on with their health and their health care? What do we really know about their priorities and their concerns about this? Um, so. I at all, don't at all mean to be um, flip, um, but I think what I know is how much I don't know and how much you cannot bucket people in the same category So, um, and assume that they all have the same needs. I've actually, um, I worked for a consumer organization before coming to Academy Health um, and I was very sensitized there to sort of the different you know, DC is kind of a small town, <laughs> and there's different groups that have different associations, and they ding bring different things to the table. Um, and then I found myself sort of uh, a little bit under attack uh, about a year ago um, by a very vocal contingent who were saying, you know, unless you are a patient with X, Y, Z characteristics, you have absolutely no right to be part of these conversations. And I thought, wow, you know, and I, I totally agreed, you know, having sat in the consumer space that it was a little bit disingenuous to be at a meeting where, you know, there weren't any other patient or consumer folks and people would say, well, I'm a clinician and I'm a researcher, but I also get care, so I'm a patient, right? I can understand <laughs> not wanting to be all of those, but I think there's um, a tendency to say, patients and consumers all need and want the same thing. And my observation is just that there's a continuum, and depending on where you are in the continuum of your life, your health, your needs, your needs and expectations are gonna be really profoundly different. And we need to be able to acknowledge that and design for that at the care level, the research level, and every level. So I know that's not like a really satisfying um, answer, but that's the best sort of that I've been able to come up with in the last year, 10 years. So I agree with everything Allison said. However, I do think there are some generalizations that we can make based on surveys that have been done about people relative to their health care and their expectations. Um, I think, first of all, many people, and again, can't speak for all people in all circumstances, but people want to be well. A lot of people don't want to think about their health or their health care. They don't identify as I'm a person with a chronic condition. It's I'm me, and I don't want to even think about the fact that I have a chronic condition. I just want it to go away so that I can do what I care about in my life. So they, want, they don't want to think about their health care. Um, another thing, though, within the context of that healthcare is people seem to express real interest in a greater connection to their doctor. So this personal connection that's come up a couple times, they want to communicate more, they want to feel a closer relationship, not just that 15 minutes once a visit or once a year, whatever it is. Um, and then another thing, too, this is sort of obvious, people want healthcare to be easier. I mean, I know from a personal perspective, as a mother of two kids, I hate that I have to drive in a rainstorm, go park my car, do all this stuff, bring my kid into the pediatrician just to show that she has that same eye infection that I knew she had. If I could have just taken a picture with my smartphone and my doctor would trust me and would be reimbursed for prescribing whatever I needed to deal with the fact that she has pink eye, everyone would be so much better off. So like make this much less difficult for us, please. Like the convenience thing is another general thing I think people want. So Ruth, I hope there was a little tongue in cheek about your EHR and the finance piece. Would, maybe there wasn't. Um, would it be better to say that an EHR could identify gaps in care and could lead to uh, improvement, performance improvement and better outcomes? I think it can. You think it can? I think uh, is it is it doing it now? In some cases. Yeah. In some cases. Do you think it, do you think the EHR wasn't built for building? <laughs> no, no, I didn't say I didn't say it, I didn't say it wasn't built. I, yes, I think it wasn't built for building. 
But, but, but it was built for billing. I mean, the initial EHR was built for billing. We, we, we all understand that. And, and of course, it was easy to put in place in the office because it led to better billing. And the same thing initially with the hospital. But the hope of EHR grew from billing. I would, I would hope and the audience agrees. And that the hope was to be able to get better data, performance improvement, quality, and better outcomes. And identify, actually identify gaps in care and do that uh, eventually by individual practitioners. <coughs> I think we all agree with that. M my point is I don't think it's got there yet, uh, and uh, that it probably is being used best for billing in many circumstances, although many institutions obviously have, have uh, built their EHRs for the principles related to outcome and, 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 and performance improvement. I I'm just trying to get it better understood. Okay, uh, yes. Hi, Julianne Christie from the Vitality Institute. Um, this is more just a comment, uh, but just to let you all know that we're working with the Institute of Medicine to host a workshop on some of the ethical, legal, and social implications of personalized health technology. So the conversation will be, uh, will be furthered. We can share details uh, when, once we have a date. So thank you. Ernestine Willis at the Medical College of Wisconsin, pediatrician. I have two questions, and one is to commend Dr. Deitz for her work, and I was just wondering, could you share with us what has happened as a result that you may be changing what the practitioner does, but how does it change the institution itself, and how does that get to the community? Because people live in a community, and so if you don't have some ultimate changes in the community, that's my one question. My second question would be, in this world of technology that we have lots of information going back and forth, and I somewhat agree that we have an issue that we have to really wrestle with, and that gets back to her, the previous speaker. I wanted to know how we're going to deal with the shared liability, though, uh, where Anthem and Polari, just, uh, Palomino, just recently dealt with hackers. I'm just wondering, even though we talk about stewardship, what are we going to recommend when it comes to who takes the real liability for all of the information if it's hacked? So both of those questions. One for Dr. Dyke. So first of all, thank you. And I'll start with the, uh, the community. And um, so, you know, I think that, um, you know, changing the way that we communicate with patients and also being committed to providing tools that allow them to communicate um, and um, purposely trying to engage care partners. So this is, I think, how we're getting to the community pieces. We know that, you know, when these patients are in the hospital, particularly, you know, the intensive care, um, oncology, acute oncology patients, they're not going to have the capacity throughout their hospitalization to engage and to activate. Um, and so we really believe that unless we're able to engage they are people that they care about with them, that they want to be involved, that when they go home, that they're going to have trouble. And so in this project, we are trying to not just enroll the patient, but ask that patient, not just for one person, but who else can work with you to make sure that when you're not feeling well, that we can still um, you know, uh, further your plan of care and make sure that your goals are achieved. And so you know, from a community perspective, I think that it's a attitude shift, it's a paradigm shift, and we're hoping that that's what's communicated out, that at Brigham and Women's Hospital, they are taking the time to not only engage with me, but to make sure that the people that are caring for me or working with me when I go home are also involved in that plan. Thank you. I'm not sure whether you want to answer the liability issue. <laughs> <laughs> Oh boy. Um, well, I mean, I you know, I think there's definitely a lot of um, concern. Um, I, I, you know, obviously in the Anthem situation and some of the larger, um, you know, they are sort of the responsible, ultimately responsible party. Where I've heard this come up in the provider context is their um, sort of willingness or reluctance to absorb patient-generated data because having seen that data, are they now held to a different liability standard for interacting with it? And I don't think anyone has necessarily cracked that nut. Um, I know that Kaiser, and it's been a year since I talked with them about this, so I'm sure it's dated information, but they were sort of, 
um, allowing um, their patients through the portal to contribute um, information on exercise, diet, and sleep. And they were sort of keeping it in a cloud and you know, having the research team um, you know, in Kaiser, California, I think it was Northwest um, and California regions, um, and sort of looking at the utility of these data and then trying to figure out, all right, if we see that there's something there that's useful, how are we gonna integrate this into our workflow and sort of eke it out in bits and bytes that are, <laughs> that are sort of consumable by the, the providers. Um, and you know, once it's gone through that workflow uh, process, then you know, presumably there is some acceptance that it's now part of the record and therefore there's you know, liability. Um, but I think this is an area where there needs to be a lot of you know, further exploration. Hi, um, Sue Bakken, uh, IOM Roundtable member. Um, could the panel talk a bit more about maybe uh, preparation of individuals in general, perhaps even K through 12, to participate in, in this particular way? And also, uh, people have been uh, mentioning resistance from providers and those kinds of things. Thinking what we've been discussing um, today, what are implications for clinician education in particular so that they can be integrating these tools into their practice more effectively? All right, so I'll jump in. I love your point about preparation of the general population, perhaps even starting with K through 12 or earlier. This idea of engaging, having a mindset change that you are welcome and even must be responsible for being more engaged in your health and you can use technology as a tool to do that. I think um, having recently come from ONC, um, one of the things that we often talked about was how a, a shift in mindset is one of our biggest challenges. It's not actually about the technology or the payment. I mean, those are important pieces too, but a shift in attitudes is a really critical piece of what we're talking about here, and you really can't start too early with that. I will say um, ONC is engaged right now in a big public campaign, um, and I have a couple colleagues, I think, in the back row there. Um, related to the Blue Button Initiative, which is about getting your own data, which is, I almost said we. They are doing in partnership <laughs> with a number of uh, nonprofits and other organizations to help get the word out and get people in this mindset that it's your health, it's you, be involved. But I'd love to start it earlier in, in schools as well. And just in terms of the providers, I mean, the attitude, again, it's, uh, you know, we really have to, um, you know, when we first started implementing our uh, intervention, the patient center toolkit, um, a lot of the concern that we heard from the providers were, you know, oh, your patients are going to communicate with us. You know, are they going to be asking for bedpans or, you know, through the microblog? And um, they didn't see the value of giving patients this much information. This is going to make them anxious. And so a lot of our approach was, um, you know, providing information from the research that was there, like open notes. Okay, so there was a lot of worry before open notes that patients wouldn't be able to handle it, they wouldn't be able to understand it. And so by, you know, using that, but then also making the case that, you know, if we are going to engage with patients and they do need the same information we have, but in a patient level of health literacy and, and talking through how we were going to provide information that could be useful, not just the raw, you know, these are your diagnoses, but this is the Medline Plus content that goes with this that helps you understand, you know, how to act. So, you know, helping the consumer to see, or helping the provider to see the value and also working through with the provider um, when you're implementing the projects. And so, you know, I think as a um, researcher and an informatician, I see how much work we put into the socio part, you know, really working with, with the, uh, looking at the workflows and, and, uh, and working with the participants, the providers, and wonder how we could ever just use something off the shelf. I don't know, because um, that provider input is really important. And so maybe we can use something off the shelf, but we have to involve the providers in really implementing that and making sure it's going to work in their workflow. But that's a big piece of it is they have to be part of that. You have to hear their concerns and move with them. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Winston Wong. I'm on the Roundtable of Health Literacy, but also on the Roundtable on Health Equity. And I'm going to ask a question relative to that roundtable, as well as uh, doing a bit of promotion in that in two weeks, that roundtable will have a discussion on clinical trials. 
and uh, what we need to do to increase minority participation in clinical trials. So the question, which is a bit different than the previous line of questions, but is an attempt to concretize some of the, uh, the, the uh, concepts that you shared with us, if you thought about the challenge we have around health equity and getting more uh, vulnerable and underserved populations involved in clinical trials, in your work and you look at health information technology, what would be some important parts of how we would include technology to facilitate the involvement of underserved populations in clinical trials? Are you talking about recruitment, or you just mean participating in clinical trials in general? Well, particularly recruitment, but I don't think you can talk about recruitment without obviously talking about the participation and the need for a more diverse population to be included in clinical trials. So if I can jump in, um, when I was at ONC, we held a roundtable on this topic, and one big takeaway for me was that you need to involve a lot of, you know, healthcare is local, and you want to involve a lot of trusted community organizations or other representatives of communities that the ones you're trying to reach trust. It could be a church, it could be a healthcare organization, it could be a school, it could be anything that, you know, the, the folks that you're looking to as a group consider kind of a home that they trust. And they will help you figure out the answers about how specifically to employ technology, for example, because it's going to vary based on what group you're talking with and what are their norms, their expectations, that kind of thing. But you can't assume from sort of a 30,000 foot level, certainly as a federal government person, that you have the answers for the whole country. It's all very varied and very diverse. I think also with a lot of the PCORI trials, like right now um, on the PI for the fall prevention at um, for Partners Healthcare, and so um, we have a clinical trial, um, ten sites across the U.S., and part of it is health information technology intervention. The other part is a falls care manager, which is a nurse who's going to be following up and make sure that the patients get their tailored assessments and plans, and so. A lot of the this in, intervention, while we had the vision for it, it was fleshed out by bringing together stakeholder councils that represent all of the different areas where we're doing the research. And in some of the areas uh, in the Southwest, we have mostly um, minority communities. Minorities are the majority. And they uh, form these councils. And so it's really making sure that you're touching base from all the stakeholders that are going to be represented users of uh, the technology and participants in the trial and addressing their concerns. And so we did that in preparation for submitting the application, but you know, every month in every, at every clinical trial site, we continue to meet with these stakeholders and do refinements when we run into trouble. We ask them, you know, why is it that, you know, um, patients are not, um, you know, filling out the risk assessment. You know, what what can we do to check and and not making the decisions ourselves as clinicians and as yes, sometimes we're patients, but really asking our target population from all the different communities. Michael, hi, Michael Pasha Orlo, a member of the roundtable. Um, so uh, there's a lot of different things. One just quick vignette that I think pulls together a few different comments, including our back and forth uh, uh, over here. Uh, I, I helped build a, an IVR system that uh, called up patients before, parents before they came in for their appointments with their kids. And I went to the doctors and I said, how often do you want to see this data? And I actually did this in several other projects. The leading answer is I never want to see the data. And how about never? Okay, so we, we automatically dumped it into their next clinic note, and they said, that's awesome, because they could push one button and upcode their billing. Okay, that's the only way that you'll get them to do it. Anyway, so um, uh, I wanted to, one of the things that came up a few times, and I do see it as a big barrier in a lot of things, is HIPAA that, that came up a few times. And I think from the perspective of the health literacy thing, I, one fair comment about this, I think, is readability will not set you free. Okay, I think that's the truth about HIPAA. There's nothing you can do about readability that will make this understandable. Because it's just too, it's too complex and also it doesn't really make sense. 
you know. So uh, maybe if you can, um, if you explain. explain HIPAA. Well, we did some focus groups and tried to explain to people that the idea is we're going we're gonna to be responsible to protect your information, except in the following whole bunch of things. And then people were like, well, should we trust you or not? And it got really complicated. And in fact, the answer was, we don't know. We don't know. So anyway, I don't think readability is going to be the answer with HIPAA. Do you see HIPAA as a barrier to research in this space and empowerment for patients? And what can be done about it? Wait, can I just jump in on the, the HIPAA notice thing? I, I do want to make folks aware that um, the Office of Civil Rights, which is the part of the Department of Health that oversees HIPAA, um, together with ONC, around a year or so um, ago, redrafted that HIPAA notice and put an example that is relatively clean and readable and understandable on the website. And that also, I believe, underscores this important point that you have access to your record as well as um, that there are protections in place for it. Uh, so just know that that's out there as a resource. I just wanted to throw that in. I don't think it's understandable for the It is hard, and it may fall in Allison's category of like things that are just sort of the don't go there category, however you described it as like it's too complicated. We're probably not going to explain it generally. Um, but I think that the law itself or the rule does require that you include a HIPAA statement of some sort. So it is there. Um, so do it as clearly as possible, I guess. Um, and then, I'm sorry, your other question was is... The question is, it seems like it's a barrier uh, for the flow of information the way patients need the information to flow. And the providers are the big providers that say, no, 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 we can't share the information. But, like, yeah. the patients need the information to flow. So this is, like, the real sad thing about HIPAA. HIPAA was built on the best intentions and for good reasons, but it's been implemented terribly. I mean, just terribly. People don't understand it. People are confused. And it is often used as an excuse for not sharing data. So I think one small thing, if we could just get this word out, that HIPAA, at minimum, guarantees you the right to get your own health information. If you get your own information, then you can share it with anyone that you want to. You can donate it to a research study. You can say which providers can have access to it. You can send it directly to them. Like, think of you, the individual, as that, sometimes we used to say at ONC, the health information exchange of one. Like, you're that central point who can be like the traffic cop that says, this, I have my information. I can say where it goes. If that model were more prevalent, and it is becoming more so, I think um, it needn't be such a barrier. Yeah, I mean, I would add there's very little reason for any institution not to share information with another HIPAA-covered entity. I think where the, um, but that's not how it's interpreted, obviously. And there's a whole bunch of business interests that exacerbate that. But that, you know, <laughs> change the market. <laughs> Maybe, you know, things will, will flow and we'll have the nirvana of data liquidity that we all dream of, at least I do, because I'm kind of a nerd. Um, but, uh, but I, you know, I think where, where I increasingly am sort of spending time thinking is on the non-HIPAA covered entity stuff and all of those data resources um, that are flowing not necessarily from or to HIPAA covered entities um, and what the opportunities are there and then also what the reasonable protections uh, might need to be. So I think that that terrain is wide open for further exploration. So, Michael, to your first point uh, related, related to the payment uh, issue, I like to say that there are four drivers of behavior when it comes to getting up in the morning. One is professionalism. The second is performance. The third, there are all four Ps. The third is payment. And the fourth are patience. So how you prioritize that, I'm, I'm not making this personal. I'm just trying to make a comment. How you prioritize that seems to me to set individuals and institutions apart. And, uh, um, you know, uh, and I think EHRs need to get up, get up to that task. Let me also make a point about behavioral, uh, behavioral economics, because this is sort of the same thing. And I'm going to ask the panel about this. Uh, um, CMS did a good job with behavioral uh, economics using incentives, rewards, et cetera, with PQRS and meaningful use. Initially, it was rewards, and then it becomes, you know, you have to pay it back. 
uh, and it becomes uh, uh, a necessity, so to speak. So how can these principles of behavioral economics, whether it be incentives, rewards, schemes, et cetera, be used to ensure sustained uptake of the type of technology we were talking about today, uh, consumer-facing health technology, et cetera? Is there a parallel that enables that to occur? Uh, and if so, your thoughts. So I'm going to jump in there. I don't think there's, you're not going to see like a meaningful use program for consumer health IT. Um, however, I think the really big, my great white hope or whatever it's called, is uh, really payment reform. It's the big picture of um, changing the underlying incentives in the healthcare system so that we're no longer based on you know, pay for, for volume and we're shifting toward pay for performance. Because when you do that, all of a sudden the patient and the provider and other forces as well are aligned in this goal of doing whatever it takes to get a person to be healthy in an efficient way. And that I think will necessitate the engagement of consumers and individuals in their own health, which means relying on technology. We do it in every other industry. It just makes right. sense. More information is better. And it was fascinating, um, again, when I worked in the government, um, contrasting the different attitudes, honestly, between the provider community and some other outside um, private sector attitudes like retail pharmacies towards sort of getting the flow of consumer data. Providers were kind of, and I'm making a vast generalization, there were many that didn't feel this way, but kind of like, whoa, how about never? Like as you were saying, you know, I don't want to see the data, I don't want to get involved, I don't want to have any part of this. Whereas the retail pharmacies were like, cool, we want their data, we want to share more data, we want to give them data, we want to go back and forth, and you know, totally different mindset. But that's really because of the underlying economic incentives. So when we finally, I hope, get that right, all of this will fall into place eventually. So I have one last question, and then we'll take a break. All right, I'm Jennifer Dillahay from Arkansas, a roundtable member. Um, we mentioned earlier some discussion about involving K through 12, and I'm aware that there's a tremendous amount of health data that is in the education system in the schools and so forth that the health system cannot get access to um, because of FERPA. And somehow we have to bring this together if we want the data to flow as it needs to be. And the education system needs the health information also. But that education system is not a health system, but the data is still there. So. Uh, I don't know how aware people are of this issue. Looks like um, Allison is, maybe. Um, <laughs> so I would inter be interested in your thoughts about how we could bring this together, because if we're going to teach uh, health literacy in schools and in families, somehow we've got to integrate this. Well. I'm sorry to say I don't necessarily have like a solution, um, <laughs> but um, but yeah, I think it's yet another example of where there are data that um, definitely have to do with health that are not held by traditional health entities. And I think to Ligia's point, it's not until we have um, a different model of payment um, where people are actually responsible and accountable for the health of a population that we're going to see data flowing between, you know, and across all of those entities because they realize that just, you know, um, doing little things around the 10% of your health that's attributable to care doesn't actually make people healthier. It doesn't necessarily prevent the types of things um, that we want to, to mitigate. Um, and so I think, you know, hopefully payment reform at a long shot will get us there. At an interim level, I would say that um, 
there's been a lot of work within the federal government in the last five or six years with open data and sharing and establishing plans for exposing more data resources and hopefully having greater communication and collaboration between the federal agencies. So maybe there's an opportunity to, you know, sort of flag this issue at that level and see if there could be some interim traction before we've solved the payment reform problem. So I am not a FERPA expert, but I believe that there is something in FERPA which is similar to the HIPAA right of access, which is it's your data, you have a legal right to get it. And so maybe, just like with Blue Button and health information generally, the individual is part of the solution there. You get your own data, you're able to combine it with data from other sources and share it with whom you please. So I would think about that in the solution, empowering the individual to be the one that gets that data and shares it. So I want to thank the panel. I think this was just terrific.